So question for you. What three-letter word starts with gas? Car. Car. Yes, car. Car. Sorry. Terrible dad joke. My dad insisted that if I was preaching on Father's Day, I needed to start with a dad joke. All right, so now we've got that out of the way. Happy Father's Day to all of you dads out there. Hope it's a great, wonderful Father's Day for you. I actually heard that joke from a member of the gym where I work, CrossFit Williamsville. We were working out one day, and this is actually several weeks ago before Mother's Day. It was a Saturday before Mother's Day, and him and a bunch of other guys we were working out, they started talking about their Mother's Day plans. They were talking about, you know, you know Mother's Day, hey, we're going to go to brunch, and you know, Mother's Day, we're going you know, to get up, we're going to bake our, our, my spouse, you know, breakfast in bed, and we got cars, we're going to do all this stuff for Mother's Day, and they're like, Mother's Day is so much different than Father's Day. And I'm like, what? They're like, because Father, I mean, fathers, we don't want any of that. I go, what? And he goes, yeah, as fathers, all we want is an afternoon to do whatever we want to do. Like, we just want to be free of our responsibilities. Like, we wish we could just go to play golf without any guilt or shame. And it kind of reminds me of some of the benefits of being single that the Apostle Paul will remind us of in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So if you would, open up your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We are continuing our teaching series through the first eight chapters, or first nine chapters of the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. And last week we talked about marriage and how marriage is for life. And today we're going to talk about how sometimes there are people that might not get married. And so how do you live in a way when maybe life doesn't go the way that you want to and you end up being single? So chapter 7 Verse 25. Let's dig into the text. The Apostle Paul says this. Now about virgins. Now about virgins. So Paul is addressing these questions that the people, the Christians in the first century in the city of Corinth have about marriage and about single people now. So when he says virgins, just think about single people. Just single people in general. right? I know here at the Clarence Church of Christ we've got single people of all different ages. Some people who have been single their whole life, some people who are single again. He is addressing us. So he says, now about virgins, you've had these questions about these people. What are they to do? He says, I have no command from the Lord, but I give a judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. Now, sometimes people read this and are like, so is this God's word or not? Is this, is this inspired by the Holy Spirit, or is this just Paul's advice? No, this is Scripture. This is inspired by God's Word. The Apostle Paul is just saying, I don't have a direct quote from Jesus on this. He didn't talk about, okay, this is what you need to t- tell the Corinthians in the future in their specific situation. You're going to have to rely on my Holy Spirit for that one, Paul. And so that's what Paul is saying. I'm, re- I'm relying on the Holy Spirit here, but I don't have a direct quote from Jesus. He says, but because of the present crisis... Happening there in Corinth, probably persecution, maybe some of the sexual immorality in that culture, maybe even within the church. He says, I think it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you pledged to a woman? Then don't seek to be released. Are you free from such a commitment? Then don't go look for a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life, and I want to spare you this. Can I get an amen from all the married couples in the room, right? Yes, like marriage is difficult, right? When two imperfect people say, I'm going to love you forever. There's always going to be heartbreak. There's always going to be disappointment. Right? We're not going to be able to always be there and communicate the way that our spouse wants us to communicate. Right? There's going to be hurt feelings. There's going to be, well, we didn't do it this way when we, you know, in my household growing up. And why don't we do it this way? And why are we doing, why are we going to your in-laws for the holidays? Well, I thought we were supposed to go to ours. And there's always going to be conflict. There's going to be some hurt. And so you invite that conflict into your life when you get married. And so the, I think the Apostle Paul is saying, hey, single people, all the single people out there, don't think that getting married is going to solve all of your problems. I right? know that that is the way some, some of us single people think. We just think, like, if I just find that special somebody, then all my problems will just vanish. 
right? I'll have someone who's always going to be there for me, never have another worry the rest of my life. And God's word is like, you better think again. That's, that's complete hogwash. That is not true. You invite conflict into your life when you get married. Apostle Paul is not saying marriage is a bad thing. He's just saying, I'm warning you, just so you're prepared. And, you know, single people sometimes ask me, Sean, like, how can you be content as a single guy? Right? You've been single your whole life. How do you find contentment when you're single? And I'll admit that there have been seasons in my life where I've been more content as a single person than other seasons of my life. But one thing I've learned, that when I find real true contentment in being a single guy, I've lived by this motto. I say, Sean, don't focus on what you don't have. Focus on what you do have. Don't focus on what you don't have. Focus on what you do have. And that's true for married couples, but it's also certainly true for us single people. It's so easy to focus on what you don't have as a single person, right? You just turn on the, the Netflix, you watch a movie, and there's this couple that they're so in love, and they're always speaking kind words to one another, and they're encouraging one another, and they're going on long walks on the beach together, and they're holding hands, and you're like, that's what I need. I, I need that. I need, a, I need that person in my life. Well, that's what you're going to want if that's what you're focused on, Sean, so don't focus on what you don't have. Focus on what you do have. And all the single people in the room, think about what do you have as a single person? I'll sum it up in one word. Freedom. Okay? You have, you have freedom, right? Ain't nothing more American than that as a single person. You have freedom. Just think about all the decisions that you get to make unilaterally. Right? You don't got to run it by anybody. Like today after church, you're like, man, my stomach's growling. What am I going to get for lunch? Whatever you want to get for lunch, right? You don't, you don't got to run it by somebody like, should, should, can, we, can we do this? Can we go there? It's like, if you want Mighty Taco, you can go get Mighty Taco. It's a beautiful thing, right? You're like, when, when, when should I go to bed? Like, it's whenever you want to go to bed. You want to go to bed at 7 o'clock? You can go to bed at 7 o'clock, right? You want to stay up late, watch Netflix and all that? You could do that, right? When are you going to wake up? Whenever you want to wake up. When are you going to go on vacation? Whenever you want to go, you just ask off and you go. Where are you going to go? Wherever you want to go. It's a beautiful thing that you have as single people, that we have as single people. But sometimes we don't think about it. Sometimes we don't focus on it. Right? We don't take advantage of our singleness and the freedom that we have being single. We're always so focused on what we don't have. It leads to a lot of discontentment where you could have a little more contentment if you focused on what you do have as opposed to what you don't have. So let's continue. Verse 29, Paul gives more advice on how to find contentment as a single person when he says this. He says, what I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. Yes, the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not. Those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of this world as if not engrossed in them. For this world in its present form is passing away. Now God's word is reminding us of the temporary nature of things like marriage. Even marriage isn't eternal. Jesus told his disciples Hey, guys, some Sadducees came and said, you know, whose wife is this person going to be? They got married multiple times. He says, guys, are you ignorant of Scripture? He says, at the resurrection, we won't be given in marriage. There will not be marriage in heaven. Even marriage is temporary. Our jobs are temporary. Our money is temporary. He says, so don't, don't attach your heart to those things. He says, the time is short. He says, the time is short. What does he mean the time is short? That's a question I always have when I read passages of the New Testament, when, it, when it, makes, it makes it seem like the Apostle Paul believed that Jesus was coming back, like, within his own lifetime. I don't know if you've ever, like, read Scripture and like, was he wrong? Like, like it seems like he really believed that Jesus was coming back, and it's been 2,000 years, over 2,000 years since he said this, so is Scripture, can we not trust Scripture? I wrestle with that. But then I remember that Jesus says that 
Not even he knew. He said, he says, even the Son of Man doesn't know when these things are going to happen. When after he rose from the dead, his disciples were like, is it at this time that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus says, it's not for you to know the times and the dates for these things to happen. But the way you need to live is that the time is short, he said. He says, I'm coming back. And I'm coming back like a thief in the night. I will come back when you least expect it. And so therefore, you always need to live as if the time was short. As if I'm coming back tomorrow. And see, if, if you're not very content being single today, just imagine, what if you knew Jesus was coming back tomorrow? How would that shape your contentment? I, I think most of us would be like, oh, yeah, I can, I can do 24 more hours. I, 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 can, I, can, I can make it till tomorrow if I knew Jesus was coming back. Right? And, and, and whether you're not content as in singleness right now, or maybe you're struggling with an addiction. Maybe you're struggling not to take another drink of alcohol or not to look at pornography. Not to give in to that temptation and do those drugs you love to do. Maybe you're struggling with depression. Maybe you're struggling with anxiety. And you're like, I don't think I can do this the rest of my life. The Bible says don't do it for the rest of your life. Realize that the time is short. And so live one day at a time. Live one day at a time because Jesus could come back tomorrow. So I've had to tell myself in seasons of discouragement and seasons of my struggles and say, Sean, you don't have to think about the next 40 years, right? Sometimes it can be discouraging. Like, I can't do this for 40 more years. You don't have to do it for 40 more years. You do it one day at a time, Sean. And so just get to tonight. Just get through the night because tomorrow's a new day. Who knows what tomorrow's going to bring? You might wake up and, and you might not feel the same way that you feel today. Maybe some of the clouds are gone. Maybe some of the discouragement, maybe some of the depression, maybe some of the anxiety will be gone. After a good night's sleep, maybe things will be different. Maybe Jesus returns. And so the Bible says the time is short. Live that way, one day at a time. One moment at a time. Get to, get to tomorrow, right? If you're struggling, maybe you're struggling with not drinking, right? Say, I'll drink tomorrow. Just say, I will drink tomorrow. I will drink tomorrow. And when tomorrow comes, you know what you say? I will drink tomorrow. Right? I will drink tomorrow. And you just take it one day at a time, one moment at a time. Eventually, you know what? Those days add up. All of a sudden, you're looking back at 20 years sobriety. It happens just one day at a time. So remember, the time is short. You know, one guy that I look up to when I think about, how, Sean, how can you honor God in your singleness? Especially when you're discouraged, Sean, I think about the example of a guy named Diedrich Bonhoeffer. Some of you might know the name Diedrich Bonhoeffer. He was a theologian, a pastor in Germany in the early and mid 19th or 20th century, 1900s. He saw Hitler rise to power in his country in Germany, and he saw the state church of Germany just going right along with him, saying, Hitler, Hitler's good for our country. We need to just follow suit, just do whatever he tells us to do. And he said, Our church is no longer a church. They're not following Jesus. And so he stood opposed to Hitler and to his regime. And as a single guy, he said, I've got a mission. And he was in love with a young woman. He was engaged. But he said, because of this present crisis, I don't think it's right for us to get married. And, and so in order to help him with his singleness, in order to help him to do what God had called him to do, he started an underground seminary. Underground seminary under the, the guys of the, the Hitler and his regime. The Nazis couldn't see him. And he just did life together with a bunch of other people who were trying to follow Jesus. And they studied scripture together. They learned how to be good pastors and how to resist Hitler and his regime. He ended up giving his life for the cause. But before he did, he wrote a book called Life Together. Life Together, which he encouraged all people, single people, married people, in order to live life together. Not by yourself but with others. And he says this in the book, he's got this quote. He says, let him who cannot be alone, beware of community. And let him who is not in community, beware of being alone. What is Bonhoeffer saying here? He is saying that there are some of us who we can't be alone. We're always in groups. We're always in clusters. We're always with friends because well, in silence, kind of our thoughts maybe scare us a little bit. We're a little insecure. 
And he would say, those of us who can't be alone, it would really benefit us if we spent a little time in silence and solitude and listened to God's voice, read scripture, meditated on him, and allowed him, the good shepherd, to lead us, to guide us, and to fill, overflow our cups, to fill our souls. But he says, there are, there's others of us who we, man, we just love being alone. And, and, and we, we, we struggle to be with friends. We struggle to build relationships. He says, those people need a church family. Those, those people need a small group of people to, to journey with them, to encourage them because times are going to be tough. It, it can, life can be lonely when you're a lone ranger. He says, you, there, are, there are some of us that we need community to be able to humble us and maybe kind of smooth out the hard edges to be that iron that sharpens iron. And so he encourages us, think about, hey, how do we spend time both in silence and solitude by ourselves with our good shepherd, but also in communion with other people? If you're single, don't do life alone, right? Get, get, get connected with a, a group of people, whether it's the men's group on Wednesday morning, whether it's the quilting group, whether it's a ladies Bible study, right? Come and, come and use the extra time that you have as a single person to serve other people, whether it's in the community, whether it's here on a Sunday morning, come early and pass out the bulletins, serve in our children's ministry, serve on Sunday night in our youth ministry. But don't do life all by yourself. You know, something that I look forward to as a single guy is, is traveling. Uh, and so I, I look forward to going on mission trips. I look forward to going to conferences. Right? If you're like, man, what, what can I look forward to in the next year as a single person? Or I grab the Christian standard and just see what events are going on in our country that I can go to. And I can be amongst like-minded people to worship God and to hear Bible teaching to encourage me and keep me going. The Apostle Paul says as a single person, we've just got a little more time, a little more energy than we can give that we're not investing into a relationship and a marriage. So verse 32, he says this. He says, I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife, and his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I'm saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but so that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. To live in a way with an undivided devotion to the Lord. That's what God's word wants for us. To have an undivided devotion. Service to our King, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The Bible is not saying, okay, all, single people, like you, you are so much better than all those married people. Or, or married people, you're so much better than single people. He's not trying to exalt being single over married. He's saying, what I want for you, whether you're single or you're married, is to have an undivided focus on Jesus. Because God's Word is saying there are a lot of things that distract us from being devoted to Jesus in our world. It kind of reminds me of what the students at Arizona State University have done at their basketball arena. Several years ago, they found out that when the opposing team was shooting at the basket, behind which their student section stood, the opposing team was shooting 75% of their free throws, making 75%, a very good percentage of free throw shooting. And like, we cannot stand for this, they said. We need to do something. We need to distract these guys that are shooting foul shots when they're looking at us. So they came up with the curtain of distraction. They put it behind the goal, behind the basketball hoop. It's just PVC pipes with a black curtain. And once the guy, whoever's shooting, gets ready to shoot their foul shot, the curtain opens up and all chaos breaks loose. Right? Behind the curtain, there's someone dressed up in some costume, whether it's a shark, whether it's a baby, you know, whether it's someone who's dressed like in a clown. They once had Michael Phelps dressed in his Speedo and just start dancing. And they found, statisticians found, that the opposing team ended up shooting 15 to 20 percent less effectively when they're facing the, uh, the curtain of distraction than they were facing the other direction where there wasn't a curtain of distraction. Yeah, the, the God's, God's word is saying, hey, in our world, there is a curtain of distraction. 
There are things that want to take our focus off of Jesus so that we don't have undivided attention and devotion to him. And sometimes it's, sometimes it's marriage, right? Sometimes it's marriage. That's why he says in verse 29, hey, those of you who are married, guys, those of you who are married, you should pretend you don't have a wife. The guys are like, wait a minute, what? What are you talking about, Paul? What are you talking about God's word that I should pretend like I don't have a wife, live as if I didn't have a wife? Does it mean like, I'm free of my marital duties, like I can just do whatever I want whenever I want to? No, that's not what he's saying. Just like when he says, hey, those of you who mourn shouldn't, and those of you who are happy shouldn't pretend you're happy, he's like, are we supposed to be robots? Like you just, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, you just can't have any emotions. It's it's, it's ungodly to express emotions. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying that, you know, if you have things, if you have money, if you have a job, you shouldn't. You got to give all your money away. You got to quit your job. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, be careful what you're focused on. Be careful what you give your devotion to. Be careful what you attach your heart to, the things that get you really high, the things that get you really low. Right? He's saying, hey, the Buffalo Bills season is coming. Make sure you don't attach your heart to the Buffalo Bills and so that when they win, you celebrate like Jesus has returned, and when they lose, you celebrate like it's the end of the world. He's saying, be careful what you attach your heart to. Right? Be careful that your spouse isn't the thing that you attach your heart to because they're going to let you down. They're not always going to be there for you. Make sure Jesus is who you're living for. Make sure Jesus is your focus. Make sure your hope is found in him and not in the things of this world. It's a hard lesson to learn, but it will benefit us not only in this life and in the life to come. Someone who learned this lesson was a woman named... Helen Lemel. Helen Lemel, she grew up in the late, or she was born in England in the late 19th century. She was a talented musician, songwriter, piano player. She toured the continent, performing in front of, in front of large crowds of people. She was famous. People loved Helen, loved hearing her sing. She got the attention of a rich aristocrat, this guy. They got married. They fell in love. They had a great life for a while. They toured the country doing whatever they wanted to do. She had this life of luxury. She had it made. Her dreams had come true. And then she got sick. She got sick and almost overnight she lost her eyesight. She went completely blind. And her husband, not wanting to be inconvenienced by a blind wife, divorced her. Left her penniless, left her single and lonely. And in her darkness, she cried out to God, God, why would you allow this to happen to me? This doesn't make any sense. But in that darkness, she heard God whisper to her. She heard, Helen, you may have lost your ability to see, but you haven't lost your ability to sing. So she went back to the piano. And she started composing music that, that she would never sing in front of crowds of people. She, she would not compose music to make her famous. She composed music to give people peace and hope when the things of this world started to fade away. When, when, when what they had to live for was no longer there, when they were living in darkness. And she became one of the most prolific hymn writers in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Her hymns ended up being sung by churches all around the world, giving them hope in the midst of the dark. And one song that she composed shortly after she lost her eyesight goes like this. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of of His glory and grace. Helen, she learned where her focus needed to be. She learned that Jesus was there for her in her darkness, in her loneliness. Have we learned that lesson? I know I'm a work in progress. Let me wrap up by reading the last few verses of chapter 7 that says this. Starting in verse 36, if anyone is worried that he might not be acting honorably towards the virgin he is engaged to, 
And if his passions are too strong and he feels that he ought to marry, then he should do as he wants. He is not sinning. They should get married. But the man who has settled the matter in his own mind, who is under no compulsion, but has control over his will, and who has made up his mind not to marry the virgin, this man also does the right thing. So then he who marries the virgin does right, but he who does not marry her does better. A woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes. But he must belong to the Lord. In my judgment, she is happier if she stays as she is. And I think that I too have the Spirit of God. So this is how I see it. If you're single and you have Jesus, you've got a lot of good in your life. You've got a lot of good to focus on today. And if you're married and you have Jesus at the center of your relationship, I mean, you've got a lot of good to focus on. You know, if you're married, right, I, I want you to, Apostle Paul says, love your spouse and submit to one another out of reference for Christ. Husbands, love your spouse as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Wives, submit to your husbands as is pleasing to the Lord, because when we do that, we offer the world a picture of Christ and his love for the church. And our world is starving for godly marriages. Starving for godly marriages. For husbands and wives to reflect the love that God has for us. So wherever you are today, remember, don't focus on what you don't have. Focus on what you do have. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you that you are a loving, merciful, heavenly Father. And that we have a love from you that, although some days it doesn't seem so tangible, we know that it's there. God, some days we don't feel it, but we can trust that you are there for us, that you offer us grace and forgiveness and mercy and new life. So God, would you help us to keep our eyes focused on you? so we can help other people realize where they can find true hope and healing in this world. So in your son Jesus, in his name that we pray, amen.